Good evening. I am Bob Adler. I'm the Dean of the S.J. Quinney College of Law, and it's my pleasure to um, welcome you to the 33rd annual Jefferson Fordham debate, an annual tradition at the College of Law where we engage in the highest level of civil discourse on some of the most important and challenging issues of our time. Uh, we've got a great attendance tonight. I'm particularly happy about that because someone told me there's some competing debate somewhere <laughs> around the country. Um, I imagine that the Presidential Debate Commission didn't collaborate with us on, on the timing of the debate. Um, I am 100% certain that our participants will be more civil than perhaps in that other <laughs> debate. And I want to demonstrate to you that the two debates are actually linked in a curious way. So my only slide will show you that. <laughs> let that just let that sink in for a moment. So I want to thank uh, the people who have worked very hard to make this debate uh, possible tonight. Professor Jeff Schwartz, who is the chair of our programs committee, um, Professor Shima Baradaran Bothman, who will be our moderator and is the principal architect of this evening's debate. Um, and a special welcome to Professors Paul Butler and uh, Kevin Sabet, who Professor Bothman will introduce in more detail later. I also want to thank our events team, our IT staff for their technical support, our development and media staff for promoting the debate and doing their traditional uh, fabulous job. So the Fordham debate, as I said earlier, has become a great tradition here at the College of Law. Um, it honors one of our most distinguished former colleagues, um, Dean Jefferson Fordham. He was the Dean of Ohio State and Penn Law Schools for a total of 23 years, um, a record that I dare say most law school deans today do not care to repeat. And to Utah's great fortune, in his retirement from deanship, he joined our faculty for 20 years um, until the ripe old age of 88 um, when he passed away in June of 1994. So he was still teaching and inspiring <coughs> students in his ninth decade of life. And indeed, it was his former students, many of whom who were here tonight, who honored him by creating the Fordham debate series more than 30 years ago. So every year I try to find a tribute to Jefferson Fordham that I can quote from. Um, tonight I thought it was particularly appropriate to quote a tribute uh, written in 1988 by Father Robert Drynan. Um, I'm a graduate of Georgetown Law School. One of our debaters is on the faculty at Georgetown Law School. Um, Father Drynan was on the faculty there for many years um, after he served in Congress um, and then as Dean of Boston College Law School. But he was also a colleague and a friend of Jefferson Fordham. Um, and he wrote this description of Dean Fordham's role in the formation of the ABA section on civil rights. And the text resonates quite deeply with some of the things that are going on in the country today. So quoting from Father Drynan, in early June of 1963, President Kennedy saw the civil rights situation in America in turmoil. Martin Luther King Jr. was planning to have a massive demonstration in Washington in late August. In Alabama, civil rights demonstrators were being met with cattle prods and bullwhips. In Mississippi, churches were being burned. In late June, President Kennedy invited to the White House 250 lawyers and law professors to have a dialogue about the urgent need for the legal profession to work to guarantee civil rights of black Americans. Father Drynan proceeded to recount how it was Jefferson Fordham who led the ensuing effort. Back to the quote. Later in the summer of 1963, Jefferson Fordham called together some leaders of the bar at the annual meeting of the American Bar Association in Chicago. 
He urged the formation of a new section on individual light rights. Indeed, he became its first chair. With his customary energy and grace, he established an ambitious agenda for the section, which then and now includes the right to legal services, human rights treaties, hunger, campus unrest, the American Indian, the physically handicapped, and many other issues. The section has never lost the vision and dream given to it in its early years by Jefferson Fordham. Father Drynan then detailed Fordham's efforts and his extensive role in shaping the new section, but he closed with these words. Ralph Waldo Emerson once said that an institution is the lengthened shadow of one great man. The history of the section of individual rights and responsibilities is the lengthened shadow of Dean Jefferson Fordham. Likewise, this debate, this whole series, is the lengthened shadow of Jefferson Fordham, because this kind of discourse was his mission as a lawyer, as a law professor, and as a dean. In Fordham's own words, we of the bar must not let great problems of our times concerned with the first order of human values pass us by. We continue to address the great problems of our times in this debate series, and this year is no exception. Um, and with that, it's my great pleasure to turn the program over to our moderator, our own uh, colleague, Professor Shima Bradaran Bothman, who is also an expert in criminal law and procedure, and who will introduce the speakers and explain how the debate will proceed. On the ballots in Utah and many other states, many policymakers and citizens are wondering, what are we going to do about marijuana? Should we legalize it? Uh, should it remain criminal? And if we do legalize, it should, what, for what purpose should we allow it to be used? Recreational, medicinal? Um, and so this is the, the question of the night. We're, we're not going to deal with medical marijuana. There are about 23 states that have legalized marijuana use for medical purposes. We're specifically not dealing with that issue in the debate. But what we really are uh, asking our debaters to focus on is should marijuana remain criminal um, for non-medicinal purposes? And so that's what our uh, great speakers are going to talk about. Some people believe that legalizing or decriminalizing marijuana um, can help enhance our well-being. It can in improve the economies of the various states that allow it and possibly reduce crime due to the crime that's involved with illicit markets. Others, though, believe on the opposite side that legalization will lead to more dependency, um, more usage of drugs, as marijuana is sometimes deemed as a gateway to other drugs and it may harm young people with increased crime. Who is right? Uh, I imagine some of you are undecided tonight, as there are undecided voters all over the country, and um, it will be interesting to hear what our speakers say. They, they disagree. Uh, you might not be surprised by that. And Ke Kevin Sabet believes that drugs should remain criminal slash legal, and he'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but I want to tell you about him as well as Paul Butler, who believes that drugs, um, marijuana at least, should not be criminal. So Kevin Sabet is a director of the Drug Policy Institute at the University of Florida, an assistant professor of the College of Medicine there. And he's an author, a consultant. He's actually advised three presidential administrations on drug policy and has written, researched, and implemented drug policy for almost 20 years. He's worked uh, in the Clinton administration, in the Bush administration, and in 2001, he stepped down after serving for more than two years as a senior advisor to President Obama's drug control director, having been the only drug policy staffer to have ever served as a political appointee in a Democrat and a Republican administration. He's also appeared at the Aspen Ideas and New Yorker festivals on the Organization of American States Blue Ribbon Commission and uh, hundreds of other forums and discussions promoting the ideas outlined in his first book, great title, wait for it, Reefer Insanity, Seven Great Myths About Marijuana, which I'm sure you'll all want to go buy after this. 
Um, and then on the other side, we have Paul Butler. He's a professor of law at Georgetown University. And Paul researches and teaches in the areas of criminal law, race relations, and critical theory. His scholarship has been published in many leading scholarly journals, including the Yale Law Review, the Yale Law Journal, Harvard Law Review, Stanford Law Review, and UCLA Law Reviews. He is the author of widely reviewed book called Let's Get Free, another great title, A Hip Hop Theory of Justice, which has received the Harry Chaplin Media Award. And Paul Butler is one of the most, the nation's most frequently consulted scholars on issues of race and criminal justice. His scholarship has been much the attention in the academy and popular media. Both of our speakers have been all over every media outlet you could possibly imagine, New York Times, um, ABC, CBS, blah, blah, blah. We're excited to have them here in Utah. And so I'll stop talking. But um, what we want to do for the debate format is that um, since Kevin is in favor of our, as our resolution that marijuana should remain um, criminal, he will go first. And so Kevin will speak for 15 minutes and give his points, then Paul will speak for 15 minutes, then Kevin will have a chance to do a rebuttal for five minutes, then Paul Butler will do another rebuttal for five minutes, then we will open the, the room for questions. So there's two mics, one on this side of the room, one on the other, I'll then call on people who have questions, and then we'll reserve the last 10 minutes of the debate, so at 6.50 we'll cut off questions and let each of the speakers make concluding remarks and sum up their, their responses. So with that, we'll turn to the time to Kevin Sebet. Thank you, uh, Shima and Dean. Thank you for that uh, really interesting introduction and background and history of the, of the for, of Mr. Fordham and, and of this debate series. And thanks to all of you for being here. I guess we're all um, escaping uh, right now, another debate, um, which I th I'm hoping this one's going to be a little bit more civil. I think it will be uh, than the one that's on TV in a little bit. And uh, I say that partly joking, partly not joking. I think this issue has become sometimes the emotion gets so elevated uh, on the issue of drug policy that it's hard to have a rational, reasonable discussion about a very serious issue, a ser an, an issue that's going to affect all of us in one way or another, and that one we should truly contemplate the pros and cons of before moving forward so hastily, as I think is going on in multiple states, um, really moving forward without a fair debate at all, given the money that's been poured into this, and I'm going to get into that in a little bit. Um, and so I want to thank Paul for, for joining us thus in this discussion, and I look forward to sharing ideas, and uh, of course for the university for hosting us. Um, you know, uh, it, first of all, it's great to be in Utah. Uh, I did my undergrad at Berkeley, uh, California, and we had a group there called Citizens for a Drug-Free Berkeley. Um, <laughs> I, know. I know what you're thinking. Uh, it was about as popular as the Coalition for a Wine-Free France. Uh, so you can imagine that. So it's nice to be here. Um, but, I, but I will say that, it, you know, in, in all reality, I think that there has been this false dichotomy set up, really with all drug policy, but especially marijuana. And that false dichotomy, really a false choice, says that we have two options for marijuana. We can legalize it or we can criminalize it. And actually, I think maybe despite the question, uh, I don't necessarily think we should criminalize the use of marijuana or put people in prison whose only crime is marijuana use or even saddle somebody with an arrest because uh, whether you go behind bars or not, having an arrest record can really hurt the trajectory of your life in terms of getting a job and getting housing and health care. So I actually, and I hope it's, I can still keep talking, Shima, I don't believe it necessarily should be criminal, but I also don't think that the only other option is to do what we are doing in a couple of states and that five states will vote on in November, which is to legalize the drug. Because what I worry about with legalization is that it's not really about marijuana anymore. Um, folks, these states that are all voting on, in November, most of them have decriminalized the use of marijuana for decades. I mean, no one's been in a prison cell in California for marijuana since at least 40 years is what people, what was the last estimation. And marijuana has been decriminalized in Massachusetts for the last five or six years. Uh, folks aren't spending time necessarily in prison for marijuana use. So it's not really about marijuana, I argue. I argue that really this move to legalize is about another word that begins with an M, and that word is money. That this is about a small number of people 
who see the legalization of marijuana as their opportunity to get very rich. And you know, I got to hand it to them. They're very smart in the way that they're going about this because they are copying the playbook of another industry that this country suffered through for over a century until actually litigation is what turned some of it around. And of course, that's the tobacco industry. Uh, folks, we've seen this story before. We know how it goes. We've seen the movie. It goes very simply. You have a massive industry that relies on addiction for profit, and I will get back to that concept in a minute. And the only way that you are able to make money is if you have a lot of people using your substance. And you don't get a lot of people using your substance if your only target is adults. And so if this was about adults smoking a joint in the privacy of their own house, I actually don't care if they do that or not. I'm not against that. That may surprise you. Um, what I do care about, though, is an industry that's going to advertise, commercialize, promote, normalize, and target young people. Because, you know, if you don't touch drugs by the age, or really any gambling, any of these kinds of addictive behaviors, you, you will not become addicted to these uh, behaviors if you don't touch them until, you know, by 21. This is, a, this is something that you, you pick up when you're young, when your brain is developing. Your brain is essentially under construction for the first 25 years of your life. And, and ladies, your brains, uh, and this makes sense, develop a few years before us guys, which kind of does make sense, I guess, if you think about it. And that's true, biologically, it explains a lot. Um, I also wish I knew that when I was 15, because I could have blamed every stupid thing I did on my brain chemistry uh, and making dumb decisions. But the reality is we make really dumb decisions when we're younger. And the other thing about it, is that our preferences are formed. I mean, when's the last time you saw a Pepsi ad that targeted the over 65 set? It doesn't happen, folks. You have to target young people. And if you're in the, this business, you really need, and you don't need a huge number of them, but you need a small number of people to use your substance regularly and heavily. The alcohol industry, for example, which is another industry that I'm not proud of at all. I mean, it's an industry that's been promoting um, Reckless use that sports, you know, is, is promoting in sports, is targeting college uh, students uh, that are, many of them are under 21 still, that they don't care. That industry relies on the fact that 80% of the volume of alcohol is consumed by between 10 and 15% of all Americans. Let me repeat that. That means that 90% of us drink responsibly. We consume the 10% left of the total volume of all alcohol. Those folks, 90% of us that drink responsibly, are not the ones that are making the alcohol companies rich. Why did Purdue Pharma do what they did with OxyContin and the opiate epidemic? What did they do? They went to the mining community, to people in pain, and they said, we have this awesome drug that is not addictive, trust us, and um, it's gonna make you feel really good. And it does, by the way, make you feel really good. It's an opiate. I mean, your brain loves opiates, it's true. Opiate receptors, frankly, are much more powerful than THC marijuana receptors in the brain. That's why opium, opiates, including heroin, are so addictive. And that company did that, and is still trying to say that what they're doing isn't targeting people. And of course, the tobacco industry, for over a century, did the exact same thing. Candy cigarettes were not created for my parents. They were created for my kids. That's the whole point. You get brains while they're developing. Because you can't target adults, that's not how you make money. So if this whole marijuana issue was about getting people out of prison and stopping arrests, I'm all for it. I agree that we have racial elements that need to be fixed in the criminal justice system. I agree that we have gone overboard in a war on drugs that is focused on mandatory minimums and taking judicial discretion away. You will not find an argument with me on that. But what you will find an argument with me is on the issue that legalization, especially the way that we do it in America, you know, we are known for advertising. You know, we may go to China to make toys or you may go to you know, other countries for manufacturing, you are in Madison Avenue still. You're in the U U.S. for your advertising, for your promotion. We are the kings of that in the world, regardless of anything else. And what I worry is that this kind of legalization that is passing in these states is the kind that is simply going to rebirth a tobacco industry, an industry that relies on addiction for profit. The, again, the only way to make money is to say that your product, which is what they're saying, is not, totally not addictive. Now, is marijuana as addictive as heroin? No, I've, of course not. But the, the industry is trying to say it's a plant. I had a kid the other day say, Kevin, um, you know, plants come from God. Are you, you anti-God? <laughs> I said, well, no, I'm not anti-God, but you know what else comes from God? Poison ivy. <laughs> it doesn't mean you want to use it. 
Um, that same kid said, Kevin, I know marijuana is not addictive. And I said, really, how do you know that? He said, well, I know for a couple of reasons. One is that I read it on the internet. I type, is marijuana addictive? <laughs> and of course, by the way, we laugh, but when you do that, you have thousands of web pages funded by the industry saying that it's not, right? You'd, I don't think the average 16-year-old is reading the Journal of Lancet Psychiatry, volume 26, you know, page 535 to 550. Because if they did, they would see the connection with marijuana and mental health and illness. They would see the fact that not everybody, but an appreciable amount of 16-year-olds who try today's high-potent marijuana, which was not the marijuana that was there when I was in high school or the marijuana that my parents, you know, when my parents talk about marijuana, they talk about roach clips. I don't know anyone under 25 who knows what a roach clip is. <laughs> they talk about Cheech and Chong. I, I made a Cheech and Chong reference to a high school the other day. They just looked at me like, they, I, they sort of knew Tommy Chong from, I guess he's on Dancing with the Stars. I don't watch Dancing with the Stars at all, but I did hear that he was on it. They sort of knew it from the, this isn't about the hippie movement. God bless the hippies. You know, I, I love, they're at Berkeley. They're having a ball. They're playing the drums. I love them. Good, folks, they're not making money from this. It's guys that, like me that are. It's the 30-somethings, the Rhodes Scholars that I went to Oxford with, with the Harvard Law Degrees and the Yale MBAs who see money. This is about money. In fact, the largest industry, there's a private equity firm, they raised $50 million last month. They were asked if they used marijuana. They said, no, we have to get up in the morning. We have meetings to go to. <laughs> it reminds me of when the tobacco industry, you know what they said when they thought nobody was looking when they wrote in their memos, which again, the, I got to thank the legal profession. It was only because of the master settlement agreement of the late 90s that we even know the horrific things that the tobacco industry did to this country. They told themselves, we don't smoke this stuff. We reserve that right for the young, the poor, the black, and the stupid. Well, they said that. It's on record. So this is not about, you know, social justice. Absolutely, we should be re re reforming our drug laws. Absolutely, it's different if you're using marijuana in California than if you're a kid, uh, a black or brown kid in Alabama. I'm not denying those injustices. But to say that for some reason the legalization of a drug that if you use a lot of it, you know, it doesn't, doesn't exactly help your future. Um, I'm not here to argue uh, that, I'm not here to t convince you marijuana is harmful. Shouldn't take our word for it. You should read what the American Medical Association says. You should read what the National Institutes of Health say. You should read why every major medical association is against the legalization of marijuana on public health grounds. And by the way, that same kid who said he read on the internet that marijuana is not addictive, he said, I have another reason why I know marijuana is not addictive, Kevin. And I, and I said, well, what's that? He said, well, I use it every day, so I can tell you it's not addictive. <laughs> oh, but that's what they meant, it's a real story. And that's an industry that's doing great work. They're doing very good work by their investors, very good work by their uh, shareholders. By promoting this, today's high potent THC, you know, t marijuana is now grown in a way where you genetically breed to increase the THC, which is what binds to your brain and your body, you have receptors all over your body and brain, to, and, and that's what you like, and so it makes the THC more potent. We have 98% concentrates now, you know, the dabs that, they, that you hear people talk about that are vaporized, those are up to 98%. You know what the THC content was in Woodstock marijuana? 3%. In fact, you did never wanted American-grown marijuana in the 60s. You wanted Mexican sinsemia. Sinsemia means without seeds, because American marijuana, you had to, like, there were like twigs and seeds and leaves, and you couldn't find the THC in it. You had to take so long to sort it out. Folks, made in U.S. marijuana now, made in the USA, much better. We've become, we're better farmers than they are in Mexico, frankly. We, we, we are. We use better techniques. So we learn how to genetically breed the THC. We learn how to spray and infuse on gummy bears, on lollipops, sodas, ice creams. I don't think that the marijuana gummy candy that they're selling in, in Washington State today is really aiming at the 45-year-old occasional marijuana user. You know, there, there's a reason why you have gummies. There's a reason why even after this past when in Colorado, we sat down with the industry and said, all right, we get it, you won. Can we at least put a moratorium on the edibles? Because we know when you eat THC, it's very different than you smoke it. You don't titrate the dose. You don't stop when you're done. You eat it and you, doesn't feel, you don't feel anything for 20, 30 minutes, and then it metabolizes in most people. That can, have a, that can be very damaging. And frankly, there were thousands of emergency room admissions last year in Colorado alone from people who they said they used marijuana a lot, but they never had experienced what an edible does. And we said, can we put a moratorium on that until we find out? 
basically it was get out of town, Kevin. We won. We have the special interest lobbyists now. You're out. And so I'm all for reforming current laws. I'm all for not saying that this is demonizing it and, you know, the original reasons for marijuana being illegal, of course, had racial uh, roots in them. Of course they did. And that's not nothing, anything to be proud of. I, we should erase that. We should, we should learn the marijuana of 2016 of the fact that it is so much powerful, more, more powerful than it was. And it's now in the hands of an industry that wants to get rich. And that is my chief concern about this whole thing. And so, again, don't take our word for it. Re please, if you're here tonight, you care about the issue, read the five initiatives in California, Arizona, Massachusetts, Maine, and Nevada. Read them for yourself. Don't listen to pro and con. Read them for yourself, and you'll be shocked. You'll find that in Arizona, written deep in the law, it says three out of the seven marijuana rule commissioners that actually make the rules regarding legalization, three out of the seven have to come from the marijuana industry itself. Now, we would never turn tobacco control to, over to Philip Morris, but it's, it, people aren't paying attention to that. Why aren't they? Because that, uh, those in these initiatives campaigns, the yes side is out funding the no side by like 10 to one. I mean, we've raised a, in all, we've raised a few million dollars in the different states. They've raised in California alone, $15 million, half of which comes from Silicon Valley billionaires. Okay, they're not in that because they love, you know, they need to learn, they, 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 they can't smoke marijuana now, so they want to legalize it for themselves. No, they're in it because this is a moneymaker. And so they write laws in California, for example. If you read the California law, you will see that it allows television and radio advertising. Folks, California has not allowed tobacco advertising for 40 years. They have not allowed indoor tobacco smoking for 30-some years. If Prop 64 passes, and a judge already said that that is exactly the way that she also inter interpreted it, because the yes side said, no, no, we, di we didn't say that. The judge said, well, actually, whether you did or not, that's what it says in the thing, and it, it's, it, that is going to be the case. And they would allow indoor smoking to come back. In Denver, in November, no one's talking about this initiative. In Denver, they're voting on a local initiative to allow marijuana back in restaurants. Smoking. Kevin. Yeah. Time. Okay. Oh, I thought we were going to see the minute. Okay. No. So just to wrap up, um, this is about money. And uh, I think we need to be a lot slower in, in contemplating what we're doing rather than the rush we're taking now. So thank you. Good evening. And uh, thank you to the um, dean, uh, to my friend Shima, and to all of you for, for coming here. It's, it's a real honor to be asked to participate in the 33rd Jefferson Fordham debate. And so it's wonderful to be here. And so once again, good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. My name is Paul Butler, and I represent the people. That's how I used to start my opening statement. I represented the government in criminal court in the District of Columbia. I was a prosecutor. I was a soldier in the war on drugs. And tonight I'm going to give you a soldier's perspective on why that war has been a colossal failure. As a prosecutor, I learned that as many people as we locked up, we weren't making a debt in the drug trade or the marijuana trade. And what we were doing instead was making a lot of communities less safe. I was prosecuting a lot of 19 and 20 year old kids for nonviolent pot offenses. And what I was doing was locking up these guys with a bunch of hardcore rapists and murderers. And I was like sending them to a finishing school for crime. And when these kids came home, they learned how to be really good bad guys. If we stop criminalizing drugs, we will stop this counterproductive practice of treating kids the same way that we treat violent adults, and we'd all be safer. You know, maybe my work would have been, as a prosecutor, would have been worth its a normal social cost, enormous social cost, if it was actually getting weed off the streets. Well, we all know it doesn't do that. The war on drugs doesn't do that. Punishing people for using marijuana doesn't get rid of the market for it. 
The United States locks up more people than any country in the history of the world. We have 5% of the world's population, 25% of the world's prisoners. Uh, that cost us billions of dollars that we just can't afford. And I'll bet you if I wanted to get some weed in Salt Lake City tonight, I could do it within 15 minutes. It just doesn't work, folks. Utah, you guys spend $14 million a year on marijuana law enforcement. Dean, what could you do with $14 million? <laughs> I'll bet. I'll bet. Uh, uh, how many low-income students could get a scholarship to go to this magnificent school with $14 million a year that the state is instead using to go after people for smoking pot? And you're not getting any public safety benefit from that. In the District of Columbia, we legalized marijuana about two years ago. Uh, what does our police chief think about that? She thinks it's great. She thinks it's been really good for public safety. She said all, of the, all those marijuana arrests did was make people hate us. Uh, the, the chief said marijuana smokers are not going to attack a cop. They just want to get a bag of chips and relax. So Kevin talked a lot about addicts. Well, since statistically most of us have used marijuana, we know that it does not make the vast majority of people who use it addicts. And that's the good news. Really just a small percentage of people who use any drug become addicts. But for those addicts, we also know that treatment works a lot better than punishment. And we know that based on our experience. Uh, most of us are blessed. We, we don't have a, a crack head or a meth addict in our family. Everybody in this room has an alcoholic in our family. And, and what I heard Kevin do is just make a really good argument for the government going after those people. Maybe not putting them in cages, but getting all in their business. And, and how did I hear him make that argument? Uh, because we know if we're thinking about harm, alcohol causes a lot more harm than any other drug. Tobacco might be a second, but it's not even a close second. Weed, marijuana is way, way behind. Uh, if we want to talk about a harm that a drug cause, causes, we can think about alcohol, we can think about the dysfunctional family, families, we can think about the lost economic productivity, you want to think about crime, about 50% of people who would commit homicide are under the influence of alcohol. So is the response to that, to get the government all in our business, to start regulating it more than it does now, to lock people up for using it? No, we know that because we tried it and it didn't work. <laughs> Prohibition just created this illegal, violent market for liquor, just like we now, prohibiting other drugs, have created this illegal, violent market for those other drugs. And when you got rid of those illegal markets, you got rid of the violence. You know, Al Capone, he wasn't anything but a drive-by shooter. And so uh, I'm not a huge fan of those scary corporations that Kevin was talking about, but you know what? If there's competition, I'd rather it be from, I don't know, Budweiser um, and Anheuser-Busch duking it out at the Super Bowl with ads rather than Al Capone driving around shooting up people. We've got to have competition. I'd rather it be an illegal market than an, an illegal market. So I'm speaking based on my experience as a prosecutor, based on my research as a law professor, and also my life experience. So I think often when we think about drugs, we tend to be a little bit hypocritical. Um, so I want to keep it real. Uh, like most Americans, including our last three presidents, I've used marijuana. And, and here's the thing, I wasn't actually introduced to pot at my all African American elementary school in Chicago, or at the um, Catholic high school that I went to after. Uh, a lot more kids at that school drank than smoked weed. Uh, really, the first time I was around a lot of people who used drugs was at Yale, where I went to college. 
and then at Harvard, where I went to law school. And I'm glad that I never got caught when I smoked pot. And I'm glad that President Obama wasn't arrested and prosecuted any of the times that he used marijuana. And I actually think he turned out pretty well. <laughs> and so keeping it real, I think that what's good enough for, for Barack Obama and for, for Paul Butler is good enough for every American. Every American, including Kevin's loved ones. You know, we were talking before, and you get the same sense, I think, from hearing him today, that he's just this really decent guy who cares and wants to do the right thing. And if that's true, I can't imagine if his niece calls him and says, look, I'm, I, I had this issue with weed. I, I started smoking it, and I, I actually turned out to be one of those, you know, rare few people who, who am having a problem with it. I can't stop I don't think Kevin would say, hang on for a second, and then motion for his wife to come over. Hey, call 911. Uh, we need to get her arrested and prosecuted and locked up because she has a, 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 a substance abuse problem. Uh, I, I don't think any one of us would do that to any of our family or friends. And so, ladies and gentlemen, respectfully, what, what's good enough for our children and our friends is good enough for all of us, and is good enough for African Americans. Uh, we call it a war on drugs, but it's mainly a war on people of color. Uh, we're the main people who are the victims of it. I come from D.C. I could take the, the red line subway to the National Institute of Health, and there they tell me about 13% of people who use and sell drugs are black. That's our percentage of the population. But then I get on the red line and go to the Justice Department, Bureau of Justice Statistics, who's locked up for that crime, 60% black. 13% of people who do the crime, 60% of people who do the time. What about sellers? Same thing. Segregated transactions, just like most of our transactions in this country. So uh, when white kids buy weed and ecstasy and Adderall, they buy it from other white kids. So again, they're not committing the crime. Uh, blacks aren't any more than anyone else. We're just going to jail for it way disproportionately. Uh, we have one black president and one million black people in prison. And the book The New Jim Crow explains that the war on drugs is one reason for that. You can think about the catastrophic effects that has on families. More African Americans who have criminal cases now than there were slaves in 1850. And again, we can think about it right here in Utah. Uh, in 2010, 4,000 people were arrested for marijuana possession. 4,000 people one year in this state. 91% of those arrests were for possession. What are the police spending their time doing uh, for drug arrests? 36% are for weed. And you can kind of tell from this crowd, uh, in Utah, African Americans are about 1% of the population. Uh, but if you went to the jail, you'd see a different story. About 5% of people who are arrested for marijuana in this beautiful state are African American. In, in this beautiful city of Salt Lake, African Americans are about three times more likely to be arrested for marijuana than white people. In Iron County, blacks are about nine times more likely than white people to be arrested for marijuana. So again, uh, I don't know if the most responsible way to deal with the issue is to lock up people. And I don't know if we actually want to go to the kind of purgatory that Kevin described, where it's not quite legal, but not quite illegal. It sounded to me kind of like a nanny state the government in your business in the way that uh, New York tried that. So smoking, um, tried to regulate it in public places, and then it went to parks. Not only should you not be able to smoke indoors, you shouldn't be able to smoke in public parks. And, and that kind of meddling, that kind of intrusion on 
uh, on what a lot of people think is, is, is civil liberties. As long as you're not hurting other people, you, you have a, a right to do it in a democracy. Uh, that kind of got good to the mayor there, because next he turned his attention to, uh, to big gulps. You know those big cans of soda you buy at 7-Eleven? Uh, the mayor decided he didn't like people smoking those either, because those, I mean, drinking those cans of, you know, Coke, and because that's not so good for you. So he decided he was going to regulate those too. So uh, I understand Kevin's concerns, but I don't know if I want to live in that country. Uh, I, I think that part of what being an American means is you get to make some decisions that everyone may not agree with you about, but as long as you're not hurting them, um, then you get a right to do that. Uh, I had a, a really nice prime rib dinner last night. I know that's not good for me, but I don't want Kevin telling me I can't do that. <laughs> so I'm going to take my seat and you know, have a good time going back and forth with, with Kevin and hearing your questions. But you know, I, I certainly get the concern uh, about the small percentage of people who get addicted to it. And we know that for those people, the best response is treatment, not punishment. Uh, another aspect of living in this beautiful country is that we don't punish people for being sick. The American Medical Association says that addiction is a disease. It's not something that we need a criminal response for. And at the end of the day, I, I don't think we should put anybody in a cage for what they put in their mouths. There's a better way. And so it's time to end this failed war on drugs. Okay, so now we'll have um, Kevin do a rebuttal for five minutes, and then Paul will respond for another five, and hopefully the audience is thinking of some great questions for them as they are speaking. Great, thank you. Uh, a lot of things to respond to. Uh, you know, just to be clear, I'm not arguing for a war on drugs. Um, I don't th again, I don't think that the choice is a war on drugs and incarceration or uh, legalization. In fact, I agree, it should be treated like an illness. We don't want to encourage sickness, though. If it's an illness, it's something that we want to discourage. And what legalization does with its commercialization and promotion is to encourage it. Now, the thing with alcohol is interesting. Um, yeah, we had alcohol prohibition. I don't think we should go back to it. So I'm not arguing for alcohol prohibition. Now, you might think that's hypocritical. But it's not because I'm looking at it from a cultural lens. We've had alcohol has been used by the majority of Western inhabitants since at least the Old Testament, probably the ancient Rome before the Old Testament, the majority of Western inhabitants. And I'm not saying that marijuana hasn't been used for thousands of years. There were certain parts of the world, small parts, that some populations used it. But you can't, you know, I guess unless you're in Colorado these days, we don't toast with a joint, right? We, we, we toast with champagne. Not that we, that's good or bad, but that's culturally what it is. And I'm not saying we should encourage that. Actually, yes, we do have all those problems with alcohol. You're right. It, it's more problematic than heroin when it comes to crime. Why is it more problematic? Because it's more people use it. Why do more people use it? Because it's legal. It's normalized. It's promoted. That's what happens under legalization. So I agree. Alcohol is a disaster from a public health point of view. I wouldn't prohibit it because of the cultural issue. But that's my example to say I don't want to go down that path again. We, we can't go back to... You know, 70% of people drank during the time of prohibition. That's why prohibition didn't work. You can't prohibit something 70% of people do. Right now, even though it's gone up in the last couple of years, about 9% are regular users of marijuana. And yes, most of us might have tried it, and of course there were many successful people who have used it. Interestingly, while the presidential debate's going on, this is the first time in about 20 years that not, both candidates have been saying that they've never used marijuana, which has not happened for a while, interestingly enough. But I agree that, that, that a lot of successful people have used it. Well, I mean, that's not an argument for, uh, to encourage other people to use it. That's, I mean, you know, a lot of successful people, we've done a lot of things that we don't necessarily want to encourage others to do. Um, we have speed limit laws, not because everybody who goes 60 in a 55 is going to get into a car accident. In fact, most people who don't wear a seatbelt, and this is going to sound controversial, but it's true, most people who don't wear a seatbelt and get into a car crash, they don't fly through the windshield and die because they weren't wearing a seatbelt. In fact, most people who drink and drive do not get into a car accident. 
Most people who drive 5 to 10 miles over the speed limit or even 15 miles over do not get into a car accident, a car crash. But we want to discourage those things from happening, and that's why we have limits on them. And you know, one thing I, I would vehemently disagree on is I, I, I do like the fact that we don't have public smoking in parks. That does affect me, absolutely. The secondhand smoke and, with my, and, and, and for me or, or my kids, absolutely that affects me. And a pot shop in my community where you can use marijuana and buy marijuana gummy bears and where my kid's bus driver is a lot more likely to be high um, if it's legal and normalized when they're driving the bus, absolutely that affects me. Obviously, I'm not saying behind closed doors, but in, in public use. I also want to talk about the fact of social justice and legalization of drugs. Because, yeah, we do have legalization. It's alcohol, as we talked about. Guess where the alcohol stores are concentrated in this country in the urban communities? Eight times as many liquor stores in poor communities of color. Not because Hispanics and blacks drink more than whites, but because if you're an addictive business, you target the most vulnerable. Addiction doesn't just happen in the brain. It's also environmental. If you don't have stable you know, housing, health care, access to education, access to job opportunities, if your parents are more likely to work three jobs to put uh, bread on the table, you, that also is an the ingredients that happen with heavier use and addiction. So these industries know it. In Colorado, where are the marijuana stores? I, I know where they are. Denver Post even did an investigation. Many more concentrating in poorer communities. And guess what happened last year with arrest rates? for marijuana use in Colorado for kids. This is gonna shock you. Increase in arrest rates for young black and Latino kids last year, more than before legalization. Why? Because there is law enforcement going on there. In fact, you said there were three times as many people here arrested for drug crimes. Yes, there are also five times as many people, uh, African American here, arrested for other crimes. The issue isn't marijuana policy. The issue is the criminal justice system and our society generally. Absolutely, let's fix those things. Let's not pretend that we fix them by legalizing drugs. Legalizing drugs hurts poorer communities. You know, Bill Maher and, and a lot of other people who love to brag about their pot use, the billion, millionaires, they can get away with it. If they have a problem, they'll go to treatment, pay Malibu treatment, 100000 a year. Oh, I'm going to wrap up in a second. And so absolutely I think there's a social justice element. Um, legalization makes it worse, not better, as we've seen in Colorado and, and other places. Thank you. And one, one last point is, you know, we mentioned New Jim Crow and, and the book, um, The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. Interestingly enough, the, she's like one of the most vehement opposers of the war on drugs. She opposed the ballot initiative to legalize marijuana in her home state of Ohio last year. Why? Because it was a power grab by the 10 richest people in Ohio who wrote the initiative. She opposed that. And I think that's smart. And I think that's intellectually honest. I don't think it's, uh, it makes any sense to say we care about social justice, but legalizing drugs and ac access to more drugs is going to be good for our communities. Thank you. So Kevin's right. This isn't a thought experiment. It's been done. It's been done all over the world, and it's been right, done right next door in Colorado. And in Colorado, the sky is still blue. The mountains are still high. And in fact, Violent crime and property crime rates have decreased. They've gone down in Denver, which is where, as Kevin told us, most of the state's dispensaries are. So it's true that there has been more exposure to uh, marijuana uh, in young children, and that's a problem. But to me, that's a problem of, of parenting. It's a problem of not having the right regulations. It's not a problem of not locking up the thousands of people who were being locked up there um, before. Uh, driving under the influence of marijuana, that's not a big problem in Colorado. About 13%, less than 13% of the DUI arrests there are for marijuana citations. We know that driving under the influence of alcohol is a much larger problem. And the presence of, of, of pot dispensaries or even people using uh, marijuana, it doesn't seem to have any impact on the accident rate there either. So all of this parade of horribles, uh, we know it's just not going to happen, and we know that because it's not happening right next door in Colorado. And it's true that adult use of marijuana 
in Colorado has gone up. We think, we're not sure, because it could be people just weren't being honest when it was illegal, and now they're being honest. So that could be why the rates seem to have gone up for adults. But with teens, they haven't gone up. So more teens aren't using marijuana. In fact, in Amsterdam, when it's been uh, legal for years, something very interesting happened. Fewer teens used it once it became legal because it's not cool. I always say if, if, the, if we really want to stop people from using marijuana, we should make it legal, and then we should get old guys like Kevin and I to go on TV smoking <laughs> weed. No teenager would ever want to touch it again. <laughs> and again, that's actually been the experience in, in Amsterdam. So Amsterdam, Colorado, not a thought experiment. We know we can do this safely and fairly and make things better for everybody else. Uh, Kevin was talking about all this THC, how powerful weed is now, how different it was from back in the day. Well, that's the problem with it being illegal. You don't know what you're getting. If you're buying it from Connor down in the corner, afraid that the police are going to swoop down and lock you up, you don't have time to ask Connor a lot of questions. You just take what you get and hope it's good. If, on the other hand, you go to one of those weed dispensaries, one of those places where they sell pot in Colorado, uh, I've been, you got to check it out. <laughs> it, it's like Tiffany's, but with better service. <laughs> you go in, it's all laid out very nicely. Uh, it's regulated, so you have one salesperson who carefully explains to you the effect that this is going to have on you, how much TSC it is. She asks you what you're looking for. If you want less of a buzz, she points to that. If you want something that's going to help you with your back or your anxiety, or if, on the other hand, you want to giggle, you just want to giggle, then she shows you what you should take. You don't get that from Connor on the corner. You only get that when it's legal and regulated, like tobacco and like alcohol. And I guess the last thing is, I, I'm not quite understanding this, this hybrid, this weird kind of system that Kevin is hinting at, where again, it's not legal, but it's not illegal. I don't know, I guess you get a ticket for it. And, and that kind of scares me, because that kind of sounds like Ferguson. Because in Ferguson, it wasn't illegal. Well, actually, I'll put it like this. It wasn't a crime to, to walk in the roadway. It wasn't a crime to have grass that was too high in your uh, lawn. Um, but it was kind of like what Kevin wants to do about marijuana. You, you got a ticket for it. And what happened is the people who were getting those tickets were, were black people and poor people. And you get so many of those tickets, and the police have so much discretion, that what happened was that if you didn't pay the ticket, if you couldn't afford to pay the ticket, uh, then it became a crime. And so Ferguson actually had more warrants for people who couldn't pay tickets for things like high grass and weeds and walking in the runway. It had more warrants for arrest than it had citizens. And I'm afraid uh, of a system like that. So again, I, I just want the police out of the business of enforcing these kinds of laws because we know they don't do it fairly. And they also, again, can't say it enough, they don't get the drug off the street. And, and so maybe that's why, thinking about Ferguson, maybe that's why all of the major civil rights organizations are against criminalizing marijuana. So I appreciate Kevin's good faith about what's in the best interest of, of African Americans and communities of color, but when we look at the representatives of these people, uh, they agree with me, not with Kevin. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as you're lining up to ask questions, I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative and ask each our debaters a question. Um, quickly, so um, to Kevin, uh, Paul's kind of major uh, dispute with your idea that we should, you know, make marijuana um, illegal but not criminal mm -hmm. is that 
you know, there's, there's several points he made, but one of them is that the disproportionate harm would still fall mm-hmm. upon yeah. minority communities. Right. Do you have a response to that? Yeah, there are a lot of ways to devise that. You don't, you don't have to follow the Ferguson model. Ferguson, the issue isn't that the law was because you couldn't walk in the, in the street or whatever that was. The issue was that there was a fundamental issue of community distrust and racial issues going on with law enforcement. That is not going away under legalization. It's why more black kids were arrested today in Colorado than ever before. And it's legal there. So, yeah, we can devise, smart people like Paul and others can devise ways to say, look, if you're a 15-year-old and you're caught 10 times smoking weed outside, it's probably not good for you. You probably do need an edu- some kind of education, some kind of community service about, about what the potential harms are. So I think there are a lot of ways you can do this. Um, and again, I'm not with the, I, I am in line with the civil rights organizations because I don't want to criminalize it. I'm being very clear about that. But uh, I think we can create a system where we want to, dis- the overall thing is to discourage, not encourage use. So how do we discourage use in a way that is equitable, that doesn't overrun with social justice, um, but, 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 but does, so, you know, does so in a responsible way? I, I think we can devise that. I don't think it's that hard. Thank you. And then, Paul, your question I'd have is, um, so we talked a little bit about alcohol, and, uh, you know, we've agreed, I guess, that a lot of uh, alcohol does lead to a lot of crimes, some violence, things like that. And I wondered if um, you didn't really address in your remarks, you know, do you, is there any kind of concern that uh, marijuana, if legalized, um, could become so, this kind of gateway to other drugs that might create more of a similar effects of alcohol, kind of more violent amphetamines and other types of drugs, or um, create any other types of, uh, you know, potentially more addictive um, devices for people? Um, I don't think so. This whole idea about uh, marijuana as a gateway drug is a a myth that's never been proven. And, And again, if we think about our own experiences, where statistically most of us have smoked marijuana, it has not led most of us to, to, to crystal meth and to, to cocaine. That's just not the effect. And the reason it's not the effect is because we have good sense. Uh, I don't smoke cigarettes. Uh, I don't smoke cigarettes not because, you know, there's a law against it. Um, I don't smoke cigarettes because I know they're not good for me. Um, I don't use cocaine. Uh, I don't use heroin. And the reason I don't use that is, is not so much because of the law, because, frankly, I'm not going to get caught, just like most of us aren't going to get caught uh, if we use it. The reason I don't use cocaine or heroin or tobacco is because I know that's not good for me. And so, again, at the end of the day, it's our common sense, it's our good judgment that's going to prevent us um, from using the most harmful drugs and help us use marijuana the way as Kevin acknowledged, most of, most of us use alcohol in a very responsible way. Thank you so much. Okay, we'll turn the time to our questions now. We'll start with on, on the right side and then alternate. Go ahead. Hi. Um, excuse me. So uh, I appreciated Paul's story a moment ago, the hypothetical about Connor on the corner. Uh, my name is Connor, and I live on the corner of my street. <laughs> I have neither used nor distributed any drugs, so I'll just let the record reflect that. Uh, My question is for Kevin. So uh, you conceded at the outset that you support decriminalization. We shouldn't be locking people up, but you oppose legalization. I'm going to call you out on what I perceive to be a bit of a double standard and and then have a a question after that brief analysis, and that is um, I'm going to assume (laughs) that you only support decriminalization for personal use but not for distribution. Uh, most of the states that have gone the route of decriminalization, that's all they're doing. They're saying if you're found in possession, we're not going to lock you up. But the, the point of sale is still a crime. Uh, in that event, then, we still have an industry. We still have a cartel. We still have people going to the drug dealer on the street, getting dirty weed laced with other stuff, and that drug dealer wanting to push them on harder, more expensive drugs because the marijuana doesn't sell a lot. Whereas, as Paul pointed out, under an industry regulated legally, we have safe access, cleaner marijuana, um, and a lot more informed uh, consumerism. And so if you oppose decriminalization, the question then is, what system would you create so that there still is not criminality with the distribution um, and sale of the marijuana that is then uh, no longer a crime for the person to possess? 
Yeah. Well, look, I mean, at the end of the day, there, if it's uh, <clears throat> decriminalized for personal purposes but not for distribution, there will be a crime for distribution. But you could set up a system, and I'm not necessarily endorsing this, but you could have a grow-your-own system, a gift system, something – uh, where you sort of try and decrease that criminality. But my, my issue is you don't get rid of the black market under legalization. In Colorado right now, the black and gray markets are thriving. In fact, in this country, we have a $700 billion gray market for cigarettes because of the taxes on cigarettes. And we have a robust black market in Colorado. Why? Well, you got to get your marijuana if you're under 21. You can't go to the store unless you have a fake ID. Where are you going to get your marijuana after midnight? Where are you going to get your marijuana? And this is the biggest one. If you don't want to pay the 30% tax imposed by the state. So they're already, you, you now have the worst of all worlds in my mind. You have a legal market promoting, go to, go to Denver, see the ads, the billboards that are supposed to be illegal, where, where, where they claim that it's regulated, they're still there. Um, the, co the coupons, the commercials, the promotions, you have all the ads, but then you also have what existed before that. They didn't go away. The drug dealers didn't like go become ice cream salesmen or something when legalization happened. They adjusted. And yes, they're actually selling. In fact, there's an argument to be made that Mexico is growing more heroin now, more poppy, since they, they decreased their, 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 their uh, marijuana market. But they're used, they're, they're, the dealers are still there. They're selling other drugs along with marijuana. And by the way, the final point on this is the legal market has not gotten rid of impure drugs. Last year, hundreds of thousands of legal, quote unquote, regulated marijuana were recalled by the state after finding pesticides, insecticides, additives, things that you can't even put into paint thinner. This is not regulated. There were all these recalls. So I sort of, my thing is, yeah, I get that there's no, look at policy, it's not perfect. You're not going to 100% get rid of the black market, 100% get rid of legal, I get it. But I'd rather have an underground market selling to a market share of 8% of Americans than that, even if you half that, half that, plus a market selling to legally, openly, selling to, you know, and, and with all the promotions that they do. And the reason why you don't use cocaine or heroin, and Paul didn't use, and I don't use that, and we don't use cigarettes. Yeah, we didn't grow up with an industry promoting cocaine and heroin. It's harmless. We don't use cigarettes because of the backlash against cigarettes after the century of lies from the tobacco industry. So, you know, I think all of those things need to be taken into consideration. Thank you. Go ahead. No, I don't think it's on. Um. Here, let me give you this one. There. He's bringing you in. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we've heard from Connor on the corner. I'm Perry the professor. Um, <laughs> my name is Perry Fine. I'm a professor of anesthesiology just up the hill where the, there's even less oxygen than here. Um, uh, I have a question um, that uh, the uh, precedent or the preceding it is the observation from your discussions that you, you both came up with, I think, exceedingly cogent points and argue those points very well. And what I actually came away from it is you are delightfully in violent agreement um, with regards to the harms of criminalizing marijuana. So my question to you is if you were granted the authority, the two of you, to come up with a healthful, cogent policy that didn't have all the harms that you've clearly laid out, and we were all far more educated about the underlying issues that, um, and, the har and the harms that exist in terms of health-related issues, um, both direct and indirect. And I would only disagree with the DUI issue you brought up, that from my, my knowledge of what's happened in Colorado, this is more of a problem. That's right. And it's a problem of detection. We, and we have not put forth um, the efforts that we need to to figure out better ways of that. But all that said, mm -hmm. with the two of your minds, if you were given the, the opportunity, I'm really curious about your answer. If you were locked in a room, for how long would it take for you to come out and draft a very useful policy that you believe and predictably would lead to far better outcomes on the criminal justice side and on the health side mm -hmm. than we currently have? Thanks, great question. Go ahead, Paul, I'll let you answer first. Okay. So I, I, I first look to history because it, it's wrong as a matter of history to talk about the um, 
the, the legalization of drugs, what we really need to talk about is the re-legalization of drugs. Because for uh, most of American history, drugs have been legal. You could go into the uh, 18th century equivalent of, of Walgreens and CVS and, and buy some opium. Uh, it, it didn't occur to, to most of our foremothers and forefathers that if some people wanted to uh, pick some leaves out of the ground and, and grind them up and smoke them, that they ought to be locked up for that, that that was anybody's business but their own. So this idea that we ought to punish people for voluntarily consuming substances um, didn't occur to anybody until the late 1800s. And as Kevin said, it was inextricably, inextricably intertwined with race. It started in San Francisco with opium. Uh, the concern was that Chinamen were using opium to seduce white women. So San Francisco, kind of ironic given what Kevin was saying about Berkeley, San Francisco was actually the first place in the country to come up with an anti-drug law, and that wasn't until the late 1800s. And you can just trace the drugs and the race. Uh, with marijuana, it was African Americans. Uh, and Mexicans, Mexican field hands, quote unquote. Uh, with cocaine, it was African Americans. Um, so I don't think we can have any system of, of criminalization that's going to be racially just. Uh, I, I don't think we've demonstrated that we can enforce those um, laws in a way that's fair. And that's for two reasons. One is because the police have enormous discretion. Again, all these black people are being locked up for using drugs. All these Latinos are being locked up for using drugs and selling drugs. But the vast majority of blacks and Latinos who use drugs, they don't get locked up. And the vast, vast majority of white people who use drugs don't get locked up. I always say, people say, well, what would the black community look like if we didn't lock up as drug users? I always say, well, look at the white community. We have drug ab abolition. Drugs are legal for white people. Essentially, white people don't really go to jail for using drugs. And I think white people are doing okay. So I think African Americans will do the same. So bottom line is, I don't think any system of punishment of criminalization for, for using or selling uh, would ever be consistent with the America that I want to live in that's with equal justice for all. So as a model, I look to something like uh, what places like Colorado have done, uh, the way regulating pot, the way that they regulate um, alcohol. So they limit sales, they limit sales to, to kids, they limit advertising. Um, again, it's not a perfect model, but when we do our cost-benefit analysis, I think it's way better for Utah to do that than to spend the $14 million a year you're now spending on marijuana possession. Yeah, again, I think it's the, the false dichotomy. We're thinking about Colorado or we're saying it has to be in a, in a box of criminalization. I, I think we could be more creative than that. Um, by the way, I, I mean, I, I, this is not an argument for criminalization, Paul, but I, I do think that, you know, whether it's a white community, black community, I, I don't think we're doing that great when it comes to drugs now. 129 people a day dead from le mainly legal drugs that, are that have been promoted as safe. Um, hundreds of billions of dollars of lost social costs. The work, we have not talked about the workplace, and the, uh, we should talk about it here at a law school. The liability issues with legal drugs and with drugs like marijuana, unlike alcohol, that stay in your system much longer, that have a, a sort of longer term effects on, within the month than a, than a drug like alcohol does, I think is an enormous issue for workplace productivity. Um, I can't tell you how embarrassing it was to go to the UN as a representative of the US government and have to sit with countries like Singapore and China and Japan and South Korea as they talk about all the wonderful things they were doing for education and teachers and technology. And then they turned to the New York Times and said, well, what are you guys debating in the, in, in the US, Kevin? And they looked at the New York Times and it had a big picture of a marijuana cookie. And it was saying, are we gonna have a half of the cookie is the serving size, or is it a sixth of the cookie? And that was the great debate we were having while Singapore was talking about how much more they should pay their teachers. And I mean, it was just, it was an, an incredible uh, display, I think, of our priorities as a country, that that is what we're debating and discussing. So to answer the question, to answer the question, which was what would we do? 
Um, I would want to see, first of all, a robust scientific-based awareness campaign for young people and parents that reflect the science on what marijuana today is. If we did a third of the campaign as we do for tobacco, I'd be happy with it. You know what, I'll take a tenth of what we do for tobacco if we could do that for marijuana. Um, I would heavily invest in prevent, early prevention education. And yeah, if a kid gets caught with marijuana at school, I agree, they shouldn't be locked up in a cage or expelled. We should see if they have a, a, a problem. We should assess them for, for other issues, see what's going on, have early interventions and, 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 and scientific-based interventions to get them back on track. So I would do that. I would heavily invest in treatment. But what I wouldn't do is turn this over to Philip Morris and the alcohol industry, which is what they're doing in Nevada, and, and the pharma industry in wanting to promote this like the model they have in Colorado. I just want to add, if we weren't locking up 500,000 people a year for nonviolent drug offenses, we could have schools like Singapore. Well, let's, let's do that, but that's, that, that's not... But we can do that without legalizing. I don't, I don't disagree with that. Um, of course, now then you have to convince state legislators, though. You, know, you talk, Paul, as if you just take the $14 million from the one thing and you easily put it in there. That's another fight you're going to have to have, which I would join you on. Um, but that, that doesn't negate the idea that this legal model in Colorado is the wrong way to go. I, we should invest more in education. Of course we should. Okay, thank you. Um, let's go to <laughs> the next question. All right. Hi, Jeremiah. Uh, I'm at the uh, Echo School of Business in an EMBA program. We just did a survey of Utah residents and found that uh, the majority believe medical marijuana should be legalized, and also the majority believe that it will uh, become legal nationally, which surprised us, actually, uh, to, to see that. But my question, I don't see a contradiction between what both of you are saying. I think you're debating a different point. Um, and so let me ask the question, uh, how do you decriminalize marijuana while keeping it out of the hands of children? I know, uh, Paul, you mentioned that it's up to the parents, but can you expand on, from both of you on this? I mean, how do you keep this out of the hands of children? How do we keep them safe? We, I can't take my kid That's in right. the car with an improper car seat without getting a, a fine for that if I'm right. caught, right. and yet we're going to just get it out there and free, so I'd like to hear your answer on no, that. And you can't offer your kid a, a glass of, of, of wine uh, without getting in trouble either. My sister actually lives in France where she can do that and she thinks it's okay, but that's a different culture, right? So in the way that we regulate alcohol is it's something that's for adults. Uh, that's the same thing that we should do for pot. We should say that it's something for adults. Now, is that a perfect system? No, it's not perfect. There are kids, especially teenagers, older teenagers, who, who, um, who sneak and get alcohol. And no doubt there'll be kids who sneak and get, um, get pot. So we're not looking at, we're not contrasting one system that's going to be perfect with another system that's going to be horrible. Uh, each system is going to have some good things and then some things that we'd like to change but make better. So we have to do our cost-benefit analysis. And so we have to think if we have this system where we treat weed like we treat alcohol, the downside would be there might be more kids who try to get access to it. And we have to compare that uh, with the problem, on the other hand, of having all these 19 or 20-year-olds who I spent years sending to jail or to probation for using marijuana, the devastating impact that that had on their lives. So I'd rather have the problem, conceding it's a problem, like we have with kids using alcohol. Uh, my sister does have a point about, well, in France, they at least learn how to do it responsibly when they do it openly and with their parents. So I agree with um, Kevin about the, uh, the better educating, the public health approach to educating people about how to use things like alcohol and pot responsibly, but again, I just don't think we can have a system where we punish people uh, for using pot um, at the same time that we have equal justice under the law. So you're saying incarcerating uh, these teenagers is uh, worse than giving more access to children? Yeah, and again, I think we have to be real careful when we say children. So, when, and again, I'm, I'm using the example both from Colorado and from what we know about alcohol. So it's not really 10-year-olds and 11-year-olds who are, who are, you know, sneaking to the liquor store or having adults buy Budweiser for them. It's uh, 16, 17-year-olds. So again, still not uh, 
old enough to make the decision on their own to do it. But again, we're not talking about little kids. We're talking about teenagers who are, you know, trying to make their way in the world. But yeah, I would not, um, I would not allow them to legally have access to it. There might be, Kevin's going to talk about a black market. Well, you know what? It's legal to buy bikes in the United States. There's still a black market for bikes, right? But most people buy their bikes on the legal market. So I think the illegal market analysis is kind of proves too much, as we say in law school. Actually, we are talking about little kids, because in the last two years, I don't, I'm not saying the sky has fallen and everything is horrible in Denver. We're not saying that. We're looking at the statistics. In the last few years, the number of zero to five-year-olds going to the emergency room because of accidental edible ingestion has more than tripled, I think, is the number, because of these little kids are seeing gummy bears on the counter, and you can't tell the gummy bear if it has THC in it, nor can I, nor can your five-year-old. And they're getting their hands on it, they're ingesting the THC, and they're ending up in the ER for four days. So, I, actually, I, th- I do think we're talking about little kids. I, I, and, I, and I think while we are in agreement about criminalization, I think we are definitely in disagreement about wanting to treat this like alcohol. I, I don't think that that's any model we'd follow. Paul mentioned himself that in high school that more of the kids were drinking than using pot. Yes, because drinking is a badge of adulthood. When you turn, That's what every kid wants to do. It's what's promoted on every single sports Uh, 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 event. It's what's promoted, what you see people that you look up to doing. I don't think that that is a model that we want to encourage for marijuana use. So any policy that I'm talking about, and I do think this is where we disagree, would I think would discourage the use of marijuana in society. I agree that we don't want to discourage them by over, you know, compensating and throw everyone in prison and criminal, but there are other ways to discourage. Certainly that does not include, though, this active promotion and commercializing in Colorado and in all these states. Remember, go back to it. It is all about the money. So I do think that you should be concerned as a parent. And I think if we could find a way where, yeah, we don't put a 19-year-old in 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 prison for smoking a joint, but we also make sure that kids don't grow up seeing adults using and thinking it's okay and normalizing it on TV and ads and everything else. I think there, you could find a way where you discourage, like we discourage people driving 70 in a 55 zone. We discourage people from not wearing their seatbelt. We discourage people through the law by not, you know, by having helmet laws. We can discourage it, but not go overboard and also not encourage kids to use. Thank you. We actually, we're going to make one uh, time for one more question and then have our uh, speakers give their closing statement. So you're the lucky last question. Thanks. Make Hi. it good. Make okay. it good. Uh, <laughs> Gage, I'm an alumni from here. Um, so Kevin, you mentioned how some of these industries target uh, vulnerable populations. If that's true, if, uh, if liquor stores, dispensaries, whatever they are, mm. are focusing their commercial tar- targeting on these vulnerable populations, then shouldn't government's efforts be towards the creation, the, the, the conditions that make those vulnerable, tar- uh, those vulnerable populations, rather than these commercial symptoms uh, that happen in whether it's commercial marijuana or commercial alcohol? Well, I would just say, I, yes, in theory they should, but show me where that's being done. We, we have, we, we, we've, we've, done, we've done this already, alcohol and tobacco. It's like we're talking about like this is in theory and we're not sure what happens when we put a legal drug on the market. We know what happens. Mass advertising, commercialization, and promotion. So, yes, governments should make sure it's equitable. But guess what? They don't. Spe- you know, I work for Republicans and Democrats. I don't care what party you're with. The special interest revolving door lobby in Washington, D.C. You know, do you know that our alcohol taxes are a fifth of what they were than during the Korean War when you adjust for inflation. Why is that? Well, not because government doesn't like to tax us. Our other taxes have gone up. The alcohol taxes have gone down because of the special interest lobby. So, yeah, in theory, we should make sure there aren't eight times as many liquor stores, for example, in the poorer parts of Baltimore than there are in the Inner Harbor where, uh, you know, I would go visit if I go to Baltimore. I wouldn't go to the other parts of Baltimore. I'd go to the Inner Harbor. I'd go to the aquarium. And yes, there are those, but those inequities are there. And those inequities are there because we have addiction for profit. The, the reason why lottery, for example, I mean, the lottery was supposed to save public education in California. I grew up in California. I, we're, we're not doing that well in education in California. We've had it for decades. But what it has done is create this inequity where 
the gambling establishments and other establishments, it's, it's, it's absolutely hurting the poor much more than it is helping them by quote unquote paving roads and, and you know, uh, constructing new schools. So unfortunately government falls short of making sure that those equities are there. Thanks. Do you have a response on that one, Paul, or do you want to save time? Okay. So uh, we'll just have our closing statements now. We'll have Kevin oh, okay. go. Did you have something else? No, I was just going to say, because I just talked about if you want to oh, go for it. Would you like to close first, or do you want, do you want the it last matter. word? Great. Okay. Well, look, I thank you. Um, look, I think um, we got five minutes, or? Yep. Okay. I want to thank you all for being here. I want to thank the university for having, I think we had a, you know, a spirited, good discussion. I only wish that the discussion was as sophisticated you know, with folks like Paul um, as it was tonight than it, as it is in the other states that are actually voting on this in three weeks. I mean, this is where this, you sort of, you can kind of set up a great thing like this, which was wonderful, but the reality is that because of the money in the marijuana movement and because there is an incentive for investors to uh, fund the yes campaigns in these five states, the incentive is that they will be first to market, we're not having this robust discussion. Um, in Nevada, I didn't mention this, I think it's worth mentioning, and I think it's important for other, other laws to come. In Nevada, the alcohol industry actually wrote the, ma the marijuana legalization initiative. And they wrote the initiative to make sure that if this gets legalized in Nevada, alcohol will be the first to distribute marijuana in that state. They will have an 18-month monopoly over anybody else who even wants to get into the business. I don't think that that's a, that's a detail that most Nevadans know. And the reason is because you have 10 or so million dollars on the pro side by the alcohol industry versus, you know, all those rich treatment workers and teachers opposing um, who have <laughs> raised a million or so. So, you know, I, I only wish we would have a proper discussion at the very least in this country to slow this train down. I don't know what the rush is to wanting to legalize and rather have proper discussions on how can we reduce the problems that we both agree are problems. I think we both agree criminalization is a problem, but we both agree, I think, that promotion to kids and the misconception about the harms of marijuana and the advertising is also a problem. And I think if we're honest with, each, with ourselves, we would both say the status quo needs fixing, absolutely, but also that Colorado is, would not be the model if we're actually concerned about social justice, more black kids arrested last year, more uh, DU, by the way, the DUI rate, yes, it is 13%. Three years ago, it was 6%. So yeah, it's gone up. And so we need to make sure that those things are not happening. And I would just say that in conclusion, this is not about your personal right to smoke marijuana. Those of you over 21, I, you know, look, your brain isn't really fully developed till 25 or 30, but we've said 21 is the adult age for most things. Have a blast. But the issue isn't about you. The issue is about promoting this to younger people uh, uh, and a industry that in order to make money has to target the developing brain. And that is what legal, we're not Amsterdam. I mean, if we were Amsterdam, I wish we were Amsterdam. They are so much more conservative in marijuana policy as what Colorado and Washington are doing. No, we are going so far beyond any European country right now, barely any advertising restrictions, weak regulations, and that's because of an industry. So I would say that we should construct a smart marijuana policy that focuses on early intervention, prevention, awareness, and treatment if we truly think that heavy use, and I think we would agree, is something that we want to discourage. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Paul, the final word. Again, th thanks to this law school for uh, this <laughs> wonderful occasion. Thanks to Toshima for being such a, a good moderator. And, and thanks to Kevin for being uh, uh, more than a, a worthy opponent. Um, and, and because, and thanks to you all for coming as well and, and missing um, the other debate. <laughs> but there was actually part of this that reminded me as well of the other debate. And in fact, uh, Kevin, in some ways, reminded me of, of Mr. Trump. Oh, wow. <laughs> and this we is were how. so civil until that. What happened? Paul, oh, you ruined it. Well, he didn't like okay. hover behind me as I was speaking. Okay. Yeah. But, but where I kind of thought of Mr. Trump was I heard a lot about what Kevin doesn't like. He doesn't like this and he doesn't like that. But I didn't hear what he likes. I didn't hear a plan to get us there. What I heard is he doesn't think it should be a crime, but he also doesn't think it should be legal. 
that's not a plan. That's not a, a prescription for, for, for change and to prove things. So I get that he thinks there's too much money in the movement. He doesn't like the fact that all these uh, young African-American and Latino kids get locked up when it's a, a crime. He doesn't think that we should treat addiction with punishment. He doesn't want to encourage kids. But I didn't hear a plan for how we get to the world that he wants. And what I have suggested is a plan. And again, I don't think it's perfect, but I think if we do regulate marijuana the way that we regulate alcohol and tobacco now, we'll go a long way to ensuring equal justice under the law. It will be better for families, for communities, and for public health. So I agree with, with um, Kevin's former boss, President Obama, when he said during his first campaign that he thinks it's blind and counterproductive to lock up nonviolent drug offenders. Uh, it doesn't work. It doesn't get drugs off the street. And again, it devastates communities. You know, Clarence Thomas, before he became the first uh, African-American on the, or the second African-American on the Supreme Court, he was a judge in D.C. And he said that he would look outside of his window of his chambers and see all of these young black men filing into criminal court in chains and he would think, there but for the grace of God go I. President Obama speaking at the NAACP, same expression, there but for the grace of God go I. My friends, the determination of who goes to criminal court in chains should not be so fortuitous. It should not depend so much on the color of your skin or how much money your parents make. As long as it does, uh, we need to be very careful about the kinds of things that we punish people for. And, and in that respect, I think we need to be very thoughtful about whether we need to regulate marijuana in the responsible way that I've described, or, or whether we continue with this mess we're in, um, where it's young people who are getting locked up, young black and Latino people, um, I respectfully suggest that the better way, the more American way, uh, the, in terms of our economic productivity, in terms of our civil liberties, and in terms of justice, is to legalize marijuana. A huge thank you to our amazing debaters, Paul Butler and Kevin Sabet. They were phenomenal. I think both of them made amazing points. And thank you. another thank you. And, and thank you all for coming to support this great tradition at the University of Utah, the Fordham Debate. Good night. <laughs>